of grace, in need of love, in need of mercy raining down from high above, in need of strength, in need of peace, in need of things that only you can give to me. perfect lamb, my refuge strong, the great I am, this is my song, my humble plea, I am your child, I am in need. Dame el perdón. Amor, dame piedad que solo viene del Señor, dame poder, dame tu paz, dame lo que solo el Señor me puede dar, dame a Jesús, Cordero fiel. mi canción, mi petición, tú eres mi Dios, yo tu creación, dame a Jesús, Cordero fiel y mi campeón, el gran yo soy. Es mi canción, mi petición, tú eres mi Dios, yo tu creación, tú eres mi Dios, yo tu creación. Paul's letter to Philemon. It was written during one of Paul's many imprisonments, and it's actually his shortest letter in the New Testament, but don't let its size trick you. It's actually one of the most explosive things that Paul ever wrote. Here's the backstory that we can piece together from details within the letter. Philemon was a well-to-do Roman citizen from Colossae who likely met Paul during his mission in Ephesus, and he became a follower of Jesus. Then later, when Paul's co-worker Epaphras started a Jesus community in Colossae, Philemon became a leader of a church that met in his house. Now, Philemon, like all household patriarchs in the Roman world, owned slaves, one of whom was named Onesimus. And at some point, these two had a serious conflict. Onesimus wronged Philemon in some way. Maybe it was theft, or maybe he cheated him. We don't exactly know. But afterwards, Onesimus ran away. Eventually, Onesimus came to Paul in prison, likely to appeal for help. And in the process, he became a follower of Jesus and then a beloved assistant of Paul. And so Paul finds himself in a very difficult and delicate situation as he writes this letter. He's going to ask Philemon not just to forgive Onesimus and receive him back, but to embrace him as a brother in the Messiah and no longer as a slave. Here's how he does it. Paul opens with a prayer, first praising Philemon and thanking God for the love and faithfulness he's shown to Jesus, to his people. And he then paves the way for his request with this line, I pray that the partnership that springs from your faith may effectively lead you to recognize all the good things that work in us, leading us into the Messiah. Now, a key word here is partnership, or in Greek, koinonia. It means sharing or mutual participation. It's when two or more people receive something together and share in it, becoming partners. Paul's saying that faithfulness to Jesus means recognizing that all of his followers are equal partners who share together in the gift of God's love and grace. 
And for Paul, this experience of koinonia among Jesus' followers, it's not just an idea that you think about, it's something that you do in your relationships. Which moves Paul on to his request. He finally brings up Onesimus. He says that he's become Paul's child in prison, meaning that Paul led Onesimus to dedicate his life and allegiance to Jesus. And so Paul and Onesimus are now family members in the Messiah. He's been serving Paul faithfully in prison, and even though Paul wants to keep him around, he knows that this unresolved conflict with Philemon has to be reconciled if they say that they're followers of Jesus. Which moves Paul on to his bold request that Philemon receive Onesimus back no longer as a slave, but as more than a slave, as a beloved brother in the Lord. Now, this is a really tall order. Under Roman law, Philemon had every legal right to have Onesimus punished or put in prison. And Paul's not only asking him to forgive Onesimus, but to welcome back his former slave into Colossae as a social equal, as a family member. This is way more than kindness. This is unheard of. It's freeing a slave and then treating them like a family member. It upsets the status quo of the Roman social order, Why should Philemon do such a thing? And here Paul pulls a brilliant move. He recalls that key word from the opening prayer. He says, if you're truly a partner with me, it's that Greek word koinonia again, then welcome Onesimus as if he were me. And if he's wronged you or owes you anything, charge it to me and I will repay it. So in this request, we see the heart of Paul's gospel message being acted out. It's first of all about reconciliation. It's just like he told the Corinthians. In the Messiah, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them. So in this situation, Paul is putting himself in the place of Jesus. He will absorb the consequences of Onesimus' wrongdoing. He will pay the cost so that he can be reconciled to Philemon. But Paul's message was about more than just a legal transaction. It's also about koinonia. Onesimus and Philemon and Paul are all equals before God. They all share the same need for forgiveness. And so the ground is level before the cross, which means that Philemon and Onesimus can no longer relate to each other as master and slave. They're family members. They're brothers in the Messiah. Or as Paul told Philemon and the whole church of Colossae, in God's new family, people are not Greek or Jewish or circumcised or uncircumcised or foreigners or uncivilized or slave or free, but the Messiah is all and is in all people. Paul closes the letter stating his confidence that Philemon will do even more than Paul's requested. And he asks him to prepare a guest room because he wants to visit as soon as he gets out of prison. And then with some final greetings, Paul ends the letter. Paul's letter to Philemon is powerful for many reasons. It's the only letter where Paul doesn't explicitly mention Jesus' death or resurrection, and this is not an oversight. He doesn't need to explain the cross with words because he's demonstrating it through his actions. Paul's embodying here the meaning of the cross. He has made himself the place through which Onesimus and Philemon are reconciled to God and then to each other. This letter also shows us that the implications of the good news about Jesus, they are extremely personal and never private. The fact that Philemon and Onesimus are now brothers in the Messiah, it makes their master-slave relationship totally irrelevant. The family of Jesus' people is the place where all are equal recipients of God's grace. It's a new kind of society, or a new humanity, as he called it in the letter to the Colossians, where people's value and social status, it's not defined by race or gender or social or economic class. In the Messiah, there are simply new humans who are equal partners who share together in God's healing mercy through Jesus. And that's what Paul's letter to Philemon is all about. One, two, three, connect! We believe that spiritual formation and growth happen best when people connect to the Lord in three areas. One, on your own, two with partners, and three in the church. Throughout this year, we're going to highlight some examples of different ways that you can connect in each of these three areas. 
Today, I wanna to share a great opportunity to do the second one, connect with partners through regular check-in times with other Christians, and that is our discipleship groups. We're offering some weekly discipleship groups this fall that will meet on Zoom. Now, these small groups are designed to help you grow spiritually as we learn to trust and follow Jesus, connect with other Christians, and learn to practice the discipline of praying for one another. So if you'd like to be part of one of these groups, you can find the sign-up link on our website. Just go to trivalleychurch.org slash adults. And stay tuned here for more ways that you can connect with the Lord. He is a God 
One, two, three, connect. connect. We believe that spiritual formation and growth happen best when people connect to the Lord in three areas, on your own, with partners, and in the church. Throughout this year, we're going to highlight some examples of different ways that you can connect in each of these areas. I came across a great example of some folks connecting in the second area with partners. And I asked them to share their story about what they've been doing, how it all got started, and how it's helped them grow closer to God. And maybe it will inspire you to think of some folks that you can start connecting with in a similar way. Check it out. So quite a few years ago, I was um, coming back to church after a long um, absence, and I felt that I needed some help with um, studying the Bible. So I was going to Thursday night group, and I talked to Rod about it to get his opinion, and he said, well, have you thought about maybe asking a couple to do it? And I said, no, I hadn't thought of that. But when he asked me that, I immediately thought of Wes and Deanne. <laughs> and um, it took me a few weeks to get up the courage to ask. <laughs> but one day I caught uh, Wes coming out of the Family Life Center, I think, and I approached mm -hmm. him and I said, <clears throat> I was wondering if you and Deanne would like to do a Bible study with me. And he said, that sounds nice. Let me ask Deanne. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and very quickly, um, they came back with a resounding yes. 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 And that's how we started. I was so happy and very honored when she asked us to do this. I was just jumping for joy because I think it was a, a point in my life that I needed something else. Uh, Wes and I had been teaching classes for many years, and then all of a sudden we're not. And um, I just miss that. Um, I miss the teaching and I miss the studying. That's what I mostly miss. And Joy, to me, she was just part of the Holy Spirit moving her in and saying, "This is where you need to be." <laughs> <laughs> and I, um, I couldn't, I couldn't be happier. We've had such uh, a good time. It all begins when our musical doorbell rings, <laughs> and Deanna and I both get excited. Oh, Joyce is here! The and door. We really are excited about that. Uh, it's fun. We've anticipated it. <laughs> Uh, so we, we visit a little at first, see what's going on in each other's lives, exchange uh, thoughts. There may come out of that some prayer needs, there usually does. And then we settle down and we have a prayer. To me, spiritually, getting in the Word gets you closer to God and we get into it here. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done seven books of the Bible uh, and we're on our eighth and we've interjected a a more of a topical study also, so I guess there's eight studies we've been involved in. 2020 has been just a really rough, rough year for everybody, I think. But Tuesday afternoons are just joyous. I just feel like I'm a sponge. I just come in here and I soak up all their knowledge, all their love. Um, I love watching them as a Christian married couple, how they interact um, with each other. Um, has inspired me a lot um, and they just have so much knowledge that you know I feel like I'm taking so much more from them than they get from me <laughs> but um, yeah I've, I've grown a lot I've learned so many things that I didn't know um, that I probably would have never figured out on my own just studying the Bible by myself I know I wouldn't have first Peter 4 8 to 10 and we've been talking about this a lot at church Above all, love each other deeply um, because love covers a multitude of sins. Off, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in various forms.
As I've been driving around lately, I've noticed a lot of political signs out with the upcoming elections. All political affiliations aside, the thing that always stands out to me about elections is how negative everything is. People typically don't just try to build themselves up, but they also work to bring their opponents down. Especially given the state of our country at the moment, it seems like it is just one more thing for people to be upset about and one more reason for people to not get along. Then I think about Jesus and the message of love. A message of getting along with everyone and respecting everyone regardless of their station, their gender, or their race. It brings to mind the words of 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices within the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. I can only imagine how things would be if we were to live our lives more with more love and less of everything else. As Christians, we strive to follow the example of God. This time right now, as we prepare for communion, is a weekly reminder that we are blessed with to help us remember the power that love holds. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. For this reason, when we take communion every week, we should use it as a reminder to live like God, to love like God, so that rather than condemn others, we can show them and love and try to save them. Will you pray with me? Lord, as we have this bread and this juice, we have these weekly reminders of you and your love. You are love. You show us love. Let this fill us with that love and remember what you did for us out of love. Let us take that memory and as we go out in the world, let us show others love and just spread love and joy and kindness around the world. Let us spread you around the world to everyone.
In this series, we're going to study a lot of what Paul says to Philemon regarding the status of his runaway slave Onesimus. But today, I want to take a few minutes to focus on what Paul doesn't say in his letter. As you hear or read this letter, you might ask the question, why doesn't Paul instruct Philemon to give Onesimus the slave his freedom? Instead of returning Onesimus to Philemon's household so that he can be a happy, compliant, and useful servant, why doesn't Paul use his authority as an apostle to order Philemon to emancipate Onesimus? I mean, slavery is an awful, despicable institution, and now here's Paul's chance to help Onesimus and to take a stand against something that the whole Roman Empire seemed to think was an acceptable practice. Why doesn't Paul do more? It doesn't seem, when you read this letter, like the evils of slavery were much of a concern to the Apostle Paul. In another letter that Paul writes to Philemon's church uh, in Colossae, Paul says two things that seem to be at odds with each other. In Colossians 3.11, he says, Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. That sounds good. That sounds like the language of elevating Roman slaves. But then a few lines later, in the same letter, he says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. Leaving us wondering, so in Christ there's no slave or free, but if you're a slave, then you have to stay a slave and you better obey your earthly master? That's a little off. Paul's words in scriptures like Philemon and Colossians have been used throughout history to defend and to justify slavery. This scene from the movie Harriet depicts the sad truth of how the Bible was used during the slaveholding times in America. I want y'all to hold on to some words from Colossians 3.22. Slaves, honor your earthly masters in everything. And do it not only when their eyes are on you and the curry their favor, but do it with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you, Reverend Green, for those wise words. You folks enjoy your Sunday. Paul's views on slavery seem like a pretty big deal. Uh, when we read Philemon, we have to wrestle with this question. Why haven't Christians, and Paul included, cared more about this issue? We talked a little bit about slavery in the ancient world last week. We said that it was a common part of Roman society in Paul's day. Uh, a good definition of slavery to keep in mind in this discussion is a perceived inferior human under the total authority of another perceived superior human. And that perceived and false reality is established by power and authority for the sake of profit and publication of the owner's wealth. In the ancient world, an estimated 30% of the population was made up of slaves, and they were treated like you might expect a perceived superior person would treat a perceived inferior person. And while there are some differences between New World slavery in America and ancient slavery in the Roman Empire, Roman slavery was still the dignity-stripping practice of owning another person as property and using them for whatever you desired. I've heard people teach, and sometimes even in the church, people teach that slaves in ancient Rome were treated much more humanely than the African slaves that were brought over to the Americas. I've heard people say that being a slave in Paul's time was, was not that bad because the slave system was more like being hired as a nanny or being a beloved family butler in the household. And that sounds nice, but the historical evidence doesn't really support this. Roman slaves were still bought and sold as property. They were beaten. Slave families were ripped apart from each other. Slave owners routinely did unspeakable acts of abuse involving their male and their female slaves. Slaves had no rights whatsoever, and any freedoms or privileges or education that was given to them was done so just to keep them happy, just to keep them from running away. And we hear these kinds of things and we have to wonder, how in the world did this go unchecked for so long? Well, much like New World slavery that we've studied in school, ancient Roman slavery was a key part of how society functioned. It was more of an economic issue 
than a moral issue. N.T. Wright says that slavery was the engine on which the Roman society ran. It was a common part of their culture. It was as common to them as automobiles are to our culture. Imagine trying to advocate in our world, trying to get rid of all engine-powered vehicles. You could make a case for it. I mean, it's a moral issue too. Cars pollute the planet in a number of ways. Cars cause a lot, cause a lot of harm to people. In 2019, there were 40,000 car-related deaths and 4.4 million people were hospitalized just in the US alone from car crashes. So that's a good case. We should get rid of all the cars and everyone should just walk or ride their bike. Who's with me, eh? What do you think? Should we do this? That's about how well a crusade against slavery would have gone in the ancient world. In both cases, the response might have been, well, we see what you're saying, but we think the positives still far outweigh the negatives. Or people might say, yeah, but it doesn't work unless everybody does it, and everyone's not willing to do it, so sorry, I'm not in. So maybe one reason that Paul doesn't take on the whole system of slavery in Rome is that it wouldn't have yielded the results that we might want. But does that mean that Paul doesn't care at all? I don't think so. I think Paul just had a different strategy of fighting against slavery. Paul's target was not the massive system of Roman slavery. Paul's target was one guy. Paul's target was a wealthy slave owner named Philemon. And Paul helps Philemon apply his Christian faith in his own household, in his own context of owning slaves. Writing about Onesimus, the slave, Paul says this to Philemon. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. Paul tells him, receive him back, but no longer as a slave, instead as a dear brother. Which, when you think about it, that's actually more work than if Philemon had just released him. If Paul ordered Philemon to set him free, he might have done so, and then he never would have had to think about Onesimus again. Philemon might have simply just replaced him by purchasing another slave. But instead, Paul prescribes a complete transformation of the relationship between Onesimus and Philemon. Not slave and master anymore, but now brothers in Christ. And by the way, siblings is an image that Paul uses the most throughout the New Testament to describe Christians and the church. You can do a simple word search on your Bible app and see this for yourself. Sometimes Paul refers to Christians as friends. Sometimes he refers to them as co-workers or co-laborers. But brothers and sisters is Paul's go-to image for what being united in Christ looks like. For Paul, the church and the household are connected. That's why Christians are called brothers and sisters. That's why in Paul's letters, we often have what's called a household code, these new standards of relating to one another in Christ, children, parents, husbands, wives. And so yes, in Colossians 3, Paul does say, slaves, obey your masters, but not without also saying, masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair. Just like he doesn't just say, wives, submit to your husbands, but he also says, husbands, you got to love your wives. He doesn't just say, children, obey your parents, and that's it. He says, parents, don't embitter your children. So here, just like we saw in Romans and Ephesians, this Christian love for one another has to be reciprocal. It has to go both ways, regardless of social status, or else it just doesn't work. The laws of the land can tell you what you are or aren't allowed to do, but one thing they can't do is make you love someone or treat them with respect or receive them as your very own family, which is what Paul is asking Philemon to do. I think it's only the Spirit of God transforming hearts that can make that happen. And Paul was counting on Philemon being open to the Spirit's work in his heart and also in his household. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. Paul's expectation for the new slave-master dynamic in Philemon's household reminds me of the story of Oscar Schindler. Schindler was a businessman. He was a factory owner and a member of the Nazi party 
during World War II. And Schindler used his political connections to gain military contracts for manufacturing ammunition for the German army. And what began as hiring Jewish workers because they were a cheap labor force became an intentional effort to keep them safe during the Holocaust. When the Nazis came to clear out the ghettos of Krakow, Schindler moved his workers and their families to live in the factory itself. And Schindler even bribed Nazi guards with money and expensive gifts in order to keep the Jewish workers safe. And by the end of the war, Schindler saved the lives of over 1,200 Jewish people. So while the world around him was still living by a remarkably low standard, something beautiful and something transformational and life-giving was happening in Schindler's little factory in Poland. I think that's what Paul is calling Philemon to do as well. And sometimes that's how I feel. Sometimes I feel like there's these awful systems at work all around me and they're so big that I don't even know how to begin to oppose them or resist them. And I'm not saying it's me versus the world because I feel like I'm part of this system as well. At a heart level, as well as a practical level, I'm part of the brokenness of the system in ways that I don't even realize a lot of the time. And in a lot of times, I am not willing to admit. I ask myself sometimes, if I was Philemon's neighbor back then, would owning slaves feel as natural to me as driving a car? If I was a slave owner in America in 1840, would I have used Philemon and Colossians to justify a system that benefited wealthy white people like me? And how about today? Which broken systems benefit me? Colonialism? How about sweatshops? Racism? Redlining? Modern day slavery? It's estimated that there's a 21 to 35 million slaves in the world, 1.2 million in the United States alone. And 30% of all slaves today are under the age of 18. What? What? I thought that was illegal. They're not supposed to be slaves anymore. As long as there is a perceived superior human exploiting another perceived inferior human for profit, it's going to continue. So maybe instead of asking the overwhelming question, how can I change the system? Ask the first part of that question. How can I change? Change starts with me. What do I do to honor my commitment to Christ? How should I live? Well, Paul answers that question for us in his letter to the Colossian church. You are God's chosen people. You are holy and dearly loved. So put on tender mercy and kindness as if they were your clothes. Don't be proud. Be gentle and patient. Put up with one another. Forgive one another if you're holding something against someone. Forgive just as the Lord forgave you. And over all these good things, put on love. Love holds them all together perfectly as if they were one. Let the peace that Christ gives rule in your hearts. As parts of the body, you are appointed to live in peace and to be thankful. Let the message about Christ live among you like a rich treasure. Teach and correct one another wisely. Teach one another by singing psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing to God with thanks in your hearts. Do everything you say or do in the name of the Lord Jesus, always giving thanks to God the Father through Christ. I can start there, and then I can preach what I practice and practice what I preach. And maybe the Philemons in my life, the people who think that I'm a voice worth listening to, maybe they will be changed by the gospel as well. Paul says, set your hearts and your minds on things above. But when he says that, it's not just a way of saying that the injustices and the broken systems of our society don't matter. I think some Christians hear these verses sometimes and think, yeah, yeah, you know, my, set your mind and your heart on things above. There's the world's crazy all around me, but don't worry about that. None of that matters. Just think about how clean and shiny and nice heaven is going to be. But that's not a good way of thinking about that. Remember, Philemon is not just theology, the act of thinking about God. It's theopraxis. How are we going to put those thoughts into practice in our daily lives? And when Christians get this right, it is a beautiful and transformational and life-giving thing. There are Christian writings from the first and second centuries showing that there were Christians who cared about slavery, and they raised money to free slaves. Another example, 
A common way to acquire a slave in the first century was to go to a trash heap and collect unwanted babies. Now you might hear that and go, what, why would there be unwanted babies in the trash heap? Well, this was a common practice. If you had too many kids and you didn't want the baby you had, or if you had a girl instead of a boy, sadly, tragically, people would just leave their babies out to be exposed and they would die. And slave traders would go scoop those babies up and raise them until they were old enough to sell them or to use them as slaves. But Christians came along and they said, we're going to do the same thing, but with a twist. We're going to scoop up those babies, not so that they can be slaves, so that they can become family. And the early church had a reputation for going and finding those discarded, unwanted babies and raising them as their own children. In the early Americas, while many churches and Christians remained silent on the issue of slavery, several of those who led the abolitionist movement did so because of their Christian convictions. And this makes sense when you take Jesus seriously. After all, Jesus' public ministry began with him declaring, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. And for us today, freeing prisoners can take on many different forms. There's lots of different ways this can happen. It could be sharing Christ with someone who lives without any hope and letting them know that their creator loves them and Jesus, their friend and their brother, died to save them. It could be helping free someone from a soul-draining habit or an addiction. It could be supporting an overwhelmed parent with childcare. It could be reaching out to an isolated friend or a neighbor. This is a big issue nowadays. Justin and I attended a, a webinar last week that identified loneliness as being a key problem that many people are facing right now. And loneliness is linked to multiple kinds of relational dysfunctions. So there's plenty of opportunity to reach out to lonely people and free people from the thing that's enslaving them. It also could be contributing money to helping organizations for people who need family, like Agape Villages or Compassion International, or to support groups dedicated to stopping human trafficking that still goes on in our world and in our midst today. It could be just educating yourself uh, on modern forms of slavery and injustice. And the list could go on and on and on. There's lots of things that you can do. But I really believe that it starts with your own heart. You have to train yourself not to see someone as inferior and yourself as superior. That's got to be rooted out first. It needs to be practiced in the church. We need to humble ourselves with acts of love and service so that we can treat one another like family. The classic hymn, This Is My Father's World, reminds us that God loves his creation. God is not distant or uncaring to the cries of his people, and his church shouldn't be either. And I'm always encouraged when I hear the third verse of this song that reminds us of this truth. This is my father's world. Oh, let me not forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. I want to invite you to sing this song with me now as a reminder that we are God's agents of peace in this world, that we may have opportunities to free captives who are enslaved to all different sorts of things. And to remind ourselves, we have been freed because of Jesus. We once were lost, but now we are found in Christ. And we need to extend that same freedom to others. Free to know God and to love God and to sing his praises like we're going to do now. Let's sing this together. This is my Father's world and to my listening sings and round me rings the music of the spheres this is my father's world i rest me in the fall of rocks and trees of skies and seas his hand the wonders wrought. This
Each week after the sermon, I put a set of discipleship questions on our church website. Now, these are questions designed to help you interact with the Sunday message and the, and the scriptures. They're questions that our discipleship groups will be discussing, but you can also use these questions as conversation starters with the people that you live with, people in your household. You can break these out at the dinner table or when you're with your spouse or your roommate. They're designed for you to apply the principles of the sermon text to your life so that uh, you'll be more shaped by the gospel in your daily living in the same way that Paul hoped Philemon would be. So it's an important way to grow in faith and Christian maturity. Uh, and it's connecting with God through partners. That's, that's number two of our one, two, three connect. So consider making this growth area a regular part of your week.